Hello and welcome to the Oxford Online Maths Club, episode zero, the very first live stream. My name's Dr James Monroe, I'm the Admissions and Outreach Coordinator for Maths at Oxford and I'm here to talk to you today about some mathematics. Um, so, um, below me is chat, um, if you want to join chat we're over at slido.com slash oomc um, so if you join that or if you go to slido.com and put in the code oomc then you can join us in chat. Um, chat today uh, we're joined by two current students, they're fantastic, their names are Lauren and Christian um, so if you join chat you can talk to Lauren and Christian, you can talk to each other about maths um, or you can yeah talk about whatever whatever you like going on in there. Chat is moderated, uh, anything you do say might appear on screen below me. Okay, um, so coming up today we've got um, a problem called can you complete the square where we're going to try and complete the square but perhaps not in the way that you're expecting. Um, following that I've got uh, a short talk on quadratic residues. I'm going to show you a little bit of mathematics like a a little bit of a mini lecture on quadratic residues. Um, maybe that's related, maybe not. Um, that's going to be um, linked back to, uh, that's going to follow on to an Oxford Maths interview question. Um, this is an actual question that I used in December uh, that I want to tell you about just because I like telling you about mathematics. Um, after that we're going to look at bigger squares, we're going to return to the squares problem and talk about bigger square numbers and problems you can do with those. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with some sort of Q&A to fill out the hour. Okay, that's the plan for today. Um, let's go and start by looking at that problem to do with completing the square. Okay, let's see if I can get that on screen now. Okay, here it is. So the problem works like this. Um, I'm interested today in four-digit square numbers. Um, I should say at this point, I'm not expecting you to know any four-digit square numbers. Um, I'm rather just going to sort of say these are some four-digit square numbers, uh, and we're going to look at um, if you can work out what they are. Okay, um, I've put question marks over the digits. So here are the square numbers, um, and I've put question marks over the digits. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the digits, and it's your job to work out um, what the square numbers are that are hiding behind these question marks. Okay, um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, so, if I show you the first digit of this one is a five, um, and the last digit is a one. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you the first digit and the last digit. Your job is to work out what the square number is. Um, you're supposed to complete the square. Right, um, over here I'm going to show you the first digit of this one is 4 and the last digit of this is oh, also 4 um, and over here the first digit is 6 and the last digit is ah, 4 again. Okay, and here's the question, can you complete the square? Can you work out what these square numbers are? Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a moment to have a think about that. Uh, I'm going to try and talk about this problem out loud just for a minute while we're while we're thinking about it. Um, ways that you might approach this problem, um, and I'm going to have a look at chats to see if chat's working. Uh, let's see if we can get that up. Um, okay, there's a little bit of lag on chat. Um, people saying um, other stuff. Complete the square, but the, well, not the way you're used to. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. Da, da, da. Uh, this is not a calculator question. Um, hello to Average and I think other people, so other people joining chat with their names were, hi Lucy, um, hi other people, hi Grant Sanderson. Um, so if you're new to the live stream, uh, we're often joined by someone who uses the username Grant Sanderson. We don't know whether it's the real Grant Sanderson or not. Could be, might not be. Um, okay. Uh, hi to Kenny. Um, someone's got a suggestion of a square number in chat. I love it when they when they do that. Um, <laughs> it's it's possibly Grant. It's possibly not Grant. Who knows? Um, hi Adam. Uh, let's um, moderate this bit. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, cool. Great. Okay. Um, so ways that I might approach this a little bit um, are something like. Um, I might start thinking about how large these square numbers are. So the first digit gives me this clue about roughly how big 
the first the how big the square number is. Maybe that gives me some information about roughly how big the the square should be. Um, but I'd like you to also think about the information that you get from the last digit. Okay. So in chat at the moment, um, what have we got? Ah, someone below me here, Raphael says seventy squared is four thousand nine hundred. That's a true fact. I like that. Um, so possibly the first one is seventy one squared. Um, ah, yes, an, an anonymous person uh, said 71 squared. And we got some suggestions for the other ones coming in as well. This is really great. Um, okay. Um, is, it, um, is it something like 22 squared? So 22 squared. Let's see if it's 22 squared. Um, I'm not going to show you the other digits. I'm going to try and work out 22 squared. I like where the logic for 22 squared has come from. The person who said 22 squared is maybe thinking that 2 squared is 4. Um, unfortunately, 22 squared is 484. Um, which has unfortunately only got three digits. Um, I know some small square numbers. I don't know when I learnt small square numbers, but I learnt some square numbers at some point. Uh, so someone else says 4,624. I like this. People are putting lots of numbers in in chat at the moment. Um, yeah, so we can put answers in chat if you want to. Um, Adam has realised there's more than one Adam going on here. Cool, brilliant. Um, so we've got uh, suggestions coming in. Do they have to be, ah, Charlie, here's a comment from Charlie that says, uh, I think these have to be two digit numbers. Um, I think that's a really good observation. Um, they have to be two digit numbers because if it was a three digit number, then it would be at least 100. And 100 squared is uh, 10000. That'd be a five digit number, there'd be too many digits. So these have got to be two digit numbers. Okay, um, aha, okay. And here's some other suggestions for what those last numbers be. I've seen 6724 come up quite a lot uh, uh, for suggestions over here. Um, I've seen suggestions for 5041 over here. People are maybe working out square numbers. Um, there's probably a systematic way to do this. Um, Let's think about systematic approaches. Um, loads of people in chat are giving me square numbers now, which is really exciting. Um, including what the square root might be, which is good. It makes it easier for me to check whether these things are, are square or not. Um, so a way of making progress with this might be to start by saying, I know roughly how big this square is, and then I'll just check some nearby squares and see whether I can make sense of that. Um, so we might look at this first one and say, well, 70, 70 squared is 4,900. Um, so this is gonna be a bit bigger than 70. Um, is it gonna be as big as 80? No, because 80 squared would be 6,400, which should start with six. Um, so this has gotta be somewhere between 70 squared and 80 squared. And then I saw someone else in chat say, um, someone else in chat say, um, if you look at the last digit, that gives you information about what the last digit of the number that's been squared was. Okay, so we could look at this and say, um, you know, is this an even number that's been squared? I mean, no, it's not, because if you square an even number, you get an even number, and this number here is odd. Um, so we've squared, we must have squared an odd number to get this. We can do better than that. Um, we can say we must have squared something that ends in a one or a nine. Um, and it's worth thinking about that for a moment. I'm um, thinking about what happens when you square um, all the numbers between 70 and 80? Um, in fact, this one is, so if you check some check some numbers in between 70 and 80, this one it turns out is uh, 71 squared. This is five, zero, four, one. Great, okay, brilliant stuff, everyone. Um, we got that one right, okay. Uh, so it's somewhere between 70 and 80, and it's an odd number, and we can think a little bit more. Um, so actually, you can restrict down what you're looking at um, in this search for what this square number is. Okay, brilliant, we completed that square. Um, okay, what are people saying in chat? Um, most of the time to work out the unit digit, yeah, you can save most of the time by looking at the last digit to work out the last digit of this two digit number. Um, okay, so this one ends in a four, um, ends in a four uh, and starts with four. Um, okay, so let's think of some squares that are approximately right. I like this way of sort of thinking of approximate answers. Um, so if I think of numbers that are approximately right, um, this is gonna be something like, well, 4,000 is a little bit big, bigger than 3,600. 
which is 60 squared. I suppose I've got to worry a little bit about 70 squared is 4,900. I don't know whether this number is bigger than 4,900 or not. Um, so I'm not sure about what the first digit is for this one. Um, but I think it's somewhere between 60 and 80. And if it's bigger than 70, it's probably only a little bit bigger than 70. Um, so I could sort like this one. Um, okay. So, um, ah, people in chat are saying we should look at the last digit as well. If you think about the last digit, then maybe it's two. Uh, because if you end in two, then your square ends in four. More on that in a minute. Um, maybe it's a number that ends in two, like 62. Uh, or maybe it's a number that ends in eight, like 68. Uh, and in fact, this turns out to be the square of 68, I think. Um, this number is 4,624. I think that's the square of 68. Is that the square of 68? Yeah, I think it probably is. Right, okay, good. I should remember I set this question. Um, okay, last one is interesting um, because the last one, it's there's more than one possible square that it could be. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so um, Giovanni says here, is trial and error a viable strategy? And yeah, I'm doing a bit of trial and error here. Um, I like to combine my trial and error with some sort of logic about what the bounds are on my trial and error. Um, so, for example, on this previous one, we've said somewhere between 60 and maybe 80. Uh, and then we could just check all the numbers between 60 and 80. Um, or we could be slightly cleverer and say, well, I can think about the last digit uh, and then think about these twos and eights going on in there as well. Uh, that narrows down my search. And then trial and error to just check things in between. Um, and in fact, it's that trial and error that lets us down a bit on this next one where we've got um, something like um, something that starts with six uh, and ends with four. Um, so this one starts with six. It's bigger than 70 squared. Um, in fact, maybe it's as big as 80 squared. So it's bigger than 70 squared, which is 4,900. Maybe it's as big as 80 squared, which is 6,400. It's probably not as big as 90 squared, which is 8,100. It's not bigger than that. Um, and think about the last digit. It could end in 2 or it could end in 8. Um, so this could be 78, maybe. Or it could be 82, maybe. And in fact, both of those work. Um, there's two possibilities for what this number could be. Um, okay. So maybe it's this number, 6084. Um, but there's another possibility hidden down here uh, that it could be the square 6724, um, which is one that people suggested in chat. Okay. And um, so two possibilities for this last one. Um, and this square was somehow not uniquely defined by its um, first and last digits. Okay, that, I think that's um, uh, an interesting start. Um, we've got this way of working out what square numbers are. Let's just catch up with chat a little bit. Um, someone in chat say, here says, what level is this aimed for? Oh, good question. Um, so I think we put the ad out for people in roughly year 12 or year 13, uh, people who are 17 or 18, uh, or older, or younger, or equivalent. Um, so anyone watching, really. Right, okay. Um, and let's have a quick look. I feel like we've got a bit of a backlog in chat. Um, yeah, I've got 31 in chat. Let's approve some chat messages. Yeah, okay, people are saying very sensible things. Could be eight, two or eight. Yeah, people are talking about this last digit. Okay, right. Um, yeah, I'm approving a load of chat messages now. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, someone in chat is being or maybe is Tom Rock's maths. Um, worth checking out the YouTube channel if you like that. Uh, like maths, um, Tom Rock's maths is an Oxford Oxford maths channel as well. Um, good shout out. Right, okay, we've completed some squares. We're going to come back to this problem later on. Um, but now I'd like to brilliantly segue uh, into talking about um, something called quadratic residues. Um, I'd like to show you a little bit of maths theory. Uh, and if you if you were here for the previous live stream in 2020, um, this is something we didn't do very much of. Uh, the previous live stream was mostly focused on doing problems and solving things, and we didn't do much um, seeing extra bits of maths. Um, so this is going to be something slightly new uh, that I'd, I'd like to try out. Um, okay, bear with me. I'm going to turn this off. 
Um, and I'm going to look for somewhere to tell you about quadratic residues. We're going to go over here, I think. Uh, and then I need to do this. And now I'm ready to tell you about quadratic residues. OK, I'm going to tell you a very small amount about quadratic residues. Um, I'm going to try and tell you enough about quadratic residues um, to make you think, that was nice. I'd actually like to know more about quadratic residues. I'm going to look more into quadratic residues and try and find out more. Um, OK. Um, so here's the idea. Um, let's dig into that thing that some people in chat seem to already know, um, but maybe might not be uh, might not be so familiar to you. Um, let's look at the last digits of square numbers. Okay, so let's work out some square numbers. Um, we've got one squared um, is one. Welcome to the Oxford Maths live stream. Two squared is four. Um, three squared is nine, um, four squared is 16, five squared is 25, six squared is 36, I'm already running out of space due to poor planning, um, seven squared is 49, eight squared is 64, nine squared is 81, and then I guess 100 squared, uh, 10 squared, sorry, is 100, um, and, and then there's something starts happening, 11 squared is 121, 12 squared is 144. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to look for patterns in the last digit. Um, so I'm going to look at what's going on here. So uh, my last digits are 149, 656, 941, 014. Okay. So a lot of a lot of what you do as a mathematician is you look for patterns and you look for things, um, patterns in anything you're interested in. Here we're interested in the square numbers and we're looking for patterns that are going on in those square numbers. I mean, it looks like the possible digits. Well, what have I seen? I've seen, oh, hello. I've seen some possible digits. Uh, possible digits. Zero seems to be possible, because I could do 10 squared. One seems to be possible. Four, nine. Um, six is possible. Five is possible. Um, and after a while, it looks like one, four, nine, six, five, six, nine, four, one, nine, four, one. Looks like this pattern goes forwards and then backwards, right? One, four, nine, six, five, six, nine, four, one. And then after going backwards, there's a zero and then it repeats again. Um, one, four is starting the pattern again. And if I keep going, 13 squared is one, six, nine, and it's in a nine. Um, so it looks like this repeats. Um, once you've seen a pattern in maths, it's quite nice to try and work out why it's, why it's behaving like that. Um, so here, this pattern seems to repeat every 10 numbers. If I add 10 to 1, I get 11, and the square seems to be ending in the same same digit. Actually, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, it says that when you're squaring a number, the, the last digit that you get only depends on the last digit of the thing that you squared. Um, so, for example, um, if we were looking at 21 squared, then that would be, I don't know what, I don't know what, 1 would end in a 1, kind of because it just depends on the last digit. Now, you know this from the way that multiplication works. If I sent you to go and work out 21 times 21, then you would go and work out kind of units times units is one, and then everything else you work out after that um, is gonna be um, something like, how do you do multiplication? 40, 400 or something. Everything you do after that is going to involve a multiple of 10. Um, so it's just the units times units that give you this one for the last digit at the end. So you kind of already know from the way that multiplication works how it's only the last digits that affect this. Um, okay, so we've got this kind of observation, observation, and then we've got some intuition for why it works, um, and then we can try and make it into algebra. So we can try and take the algebra of this and explain why, explain why this works. I'm going to bring in some notation. Um, I'm going to say, uh, uh, suppose our number is 10a plus b where I guess I want b to be somewhere between naught and 9. Uh, okay, so if our number is 10a plus b, then the number squared, 10a plus b squared, um, is going to be something like 100a squared plus 20ab plus b squared. Okay. 
it's the crucial bit. Um, this part is a multiple of 10. So it doesn't affect the last digit. In fact, the only thing that only this bit affects the last digit. Okay. What are people in chat saying? Oh, people in chat saying x plus 10 is equal to x mod 10. Um, that's an exciting, exciting notation for this idea about just looking at the the last digit. Um, that mod 10 notation in chat just below me. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, that mod 10 notation um, means ignore any uh, multiples of 10. Um, so two numbers are equal mod 10, or equivalent mod 10, if they differ by a multiple of 10. And there's some algebra that you can do with that notation. Um, so if you're interested in that, you could look up modular arithmetic, which is what Eleanor's doing in chat just there. Good stuff. Right, okay. Um, what else are we looking at? Um, I saw someone else say that we should start, maybe think about zero squared equals zero. Um, that ends in zero, Let's do a zero with a circle around it. Um, so that's quite nice. Uh, that, that sort of extends the pattern backwards as well, which is kind of cool. Um, okay. Um, and we've now got this, this idea that only the last digit affects the last digit of the square. So actually that means that our list above, our list above is complete. If you want to work out the possible digits that a square could end with, this is all of them. And it's not the case that if you square a huge number like 307, and you, if you square that, then I know that's gonna end in the same thing that I got when I squared seven, um, so nine. Um, that's quite powerful. That means that we can work out what the possible last digits of a square number are just by squaring small numbers. Okay, maybe you already know all of this, maybe you've already seen this pattern in square numbers. Um, if you haven't seen this, then welcome to a nice pattern in, in square numbers. If you have seen this, and try and remember when you saw this, um, and remember what it felt like to discover this kind of pattern in numbers. Um, okay, let's talk about other bases. Um, I never know how much people know about other bases. Um, but I want to I really quickly try and extend this idea. Um, there's nothing special about the number 10. Um, we can look at things like, um, uh, well, let's, let's look at things like uh, 4a plus b. We could take all the 10s and swap them to 4s. Um, well, that's going to be multiple of 4. Loads of things that depend on 4. Multiple of 4 plus b squared. So kind of in base four, it has the same last digit as b squared does. Um, I think it's probably a good idea at this point to stop saying same last digit mod four. So I can, we've got a choice here. We can write same last digit in base four, but people don't really know much about base four. People don't like working with some people don't like using words like base four. Um, so rather than saying same last digit in base four, we could say, let's bring in this new notation that somebody used earlier in chat, um, which is to say that 4a plus b squared is equivalent to b squared mod four, modulo four. Um, so all this means is that, what does this mean? This just means so this kind of crazy notation with the triple equals sign and mod four in brackets over here just means that the difference between left hand side and the right hand side is a multiple of four. Oh, multiple of four. And um, that's all that this crazy notation kind of means. Um, it's for number theory problems where you don't want to write out lots of times differs by a multiple of four or um, this thing is a multiple of four, you would just write uh, is equal to zero modulo four if it's a multiple of four, because it differs from itself by uh, by zero. I said it differs from a multiple of four by zero. Okay, um, so we might write things like that. That means that in that base, you can work out the last digits of square numbers um, just by working out squares of small numbers up to, you know, like before we were ignoring other digits, um, now we can ignore multiples of or something like that. Um, okay, 
So this means that if we're looking in the world where we're interested in four instead of 10, that kind of guess base four, um, uh, we just need to look at the squares of 0, 1, 2, 3 to work out possible last digits of squares. Okay, it's probably time I gave you a word for possible last digits of squares in base 4. So this is um, the possible last digits of squares. Um, there's a word for these. Um, these are called quadratic residues. Quad, hang on, spell. Quadratic residues. So I'm getting used to my writing space. There we go. Um, quadratic residues. Okay. Uh, sort of the, the possible remainders, let's phrase this differently, possible remainders when you divide a square by, I don't know, K or something, or any, any, anything, anything you're interested in. So you might, you might talk about the quadratic residues um, base 10 um, to look at what happens when you divide a square by 10. What are the possible remainders? You might look at uh, the quadratic residues, which are four, to look at what the possible remainders are when you divide a square by four. By the way, we can work these out. Um, let's 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 make this a bit more concrete. Um, let's try and work these out. So, uh, what do I need to do? I need to take the numbers not one, two, three. I need to square them. Um, so, and just think about just think about the remainder when I divide by four. Okay. So, naught squared is naught. So squares can end in naught in base four. Maybe that's not surprising. One squared is one. So squares can end in one um, in base four. Now, two squared is equal to four, which in base four, we would write as this, like 10 and a little, little four. Um, we would say there's a multiple of four here and then no remainder. So in base four, we could write it like that. Or we could say remainder zero when divided by four. Ah, writing space. I'm always going slightly off the right. Okay. Um, we can also look at 3 squared. That's 9. But hang on. 9 gives remainder... 9 gives remainder 1 um, when we divide by 4. And by what we said about only needing to square small numbers, we're now done. The only possible quadratic... The only possible quadratic residues... Okay. So we say the quadratic residues... Uh, for four are just naught and one. Um, this is surprisingly powerful. <laughs> um, if you're watching this and thinking, why are we doing this? Um, it's surprisingly powerful because it lets you say whether things are square numbers or not. It lets you do a lot more than that, really. Um, but it lets you look at a number. Um, if you see something that is two or three more than a multiple of four, Ooh, hello. It's not a square. Um, so if you're doing a problem where you're supposed to identify square numbers or think about whether things are square or not, um, then you can do tests like this to see whether it's square or not. Okay, cool. Um, I've been looking at base 4 in particular. It's interesting in other bases as well. Um, I'd like to... I think do say that it's particularly interesting for prime bases and someone below me says quadratic recipro reciprocity, which I'm not going to do now, um, is a lovely, th lovely thing to look up and um, relates, um, relates the quadra possible quadratic residues relative to one number to possible quadratic residues relative to a different number. And there's a lovely result um, that links those concepts together. So, for example, we've been. You might wonder whether, uh, might wonder whether two is a possible quadratic residue um, when you're uh, ignoring multiples of three, and you might wonder whether three is a possible quadratic residue. No, it's not when you um, when you're looking at remainders when you divide by two. Okay, why base four? Well, base four is kind of interesting because it's got this 
not everything's a quadratic residue. I mean, normally not everything's quadratic residue. Um, but base four, I just quite like. Uh, it's got this relation to the last couple of digits in binary. Um, so this test is kind of easy to do in binary. If your number's written in binary, you look at the last two digits and you can decide whether it's possibly a square or definitely not a square quite quickly. Um, so that's quite a nice test. Um, I've seen base four come up, or kind of multiples of four. Maybe I should stop saying base four and say multiples of four um, come up in other problems. Okay, that was good fun. Right, um, okay. Um, so that was uh, a kind of introduction to quadratic residues. I think, should we do one more bit? Let's do one more bit. Okay, one more, one more bit. Um, um, so, so I kind of mentioned primes. I want to talk about primes, I think. Um, there's this question about whether you get, when you square these small numbers to work out the possible remainders. Okay, so um, we're going to square small numbers. This is our plan. Square, oh my word, some handwriting. Square small numbers. Uh, remove any duplicates. Uh, I guess there's a step in here. Work out remainder. When dividing by k. So people who were criticizing my choice of base four, look, I'm looking at k now. Um, I accept there are numbers other than four out there. Um, so pick your favorite number. Um, if you want to work out the quadratic residues um, up to multiples of 37 or something, then square some small numbers. Work out the remainder when you divide them by your favorite number, maybe 37. Um, remove any duplicates you get. Um, those are the quadratic residues. Okay, um, I'd like to do one quick thing here. If k is prime, um, I guess we'll write p instead of k, um, then you get no duplicates when you square the numbers uh, not less than a. Uh, what do I? What do I want to do? I want to do. I want to do not less than a, less than b, up to. Uh, yeah, I want to square these numbers. Square these numbers a between naught and p minus one over two. I guess I want this to be an odd prime. Okay. Not scripted. Um, if k is an odd prime, we call it p and say it's odd, um, then there are no duplicates when you square small numbers between naught and p minus 1 over 2. So this step of checking for duplicates, which is a little bit annoying, um, you don't have to do it um, if you're, if you're uh, an odd prime. Um, here's why. Um, so I'm saying that a squared um, gives you different answers as you square small numbers between naught and p minus 1. Um, here's why. Um, suppose that a squared equals b squared um, with a and b both between p minus 1 and p minus 1 over 2 um, and uh, between yeah, uh, not less than a and b uh, less than p minus 1 over 2. Oh, that's way too wide. How am I going to fix this? Um, so I'm both not, so I want naught less than a less than p minus 1 over 2, and I want naught less than or equal to b less than p minus 1 over 2. Um, suppose a squared is equal to b squared. Um, well, they're not going to be equal because I'm squaring different numbers, but let's suppose they give the same last digit. Um, so let's say, suppose they give the same last digit equals this um, when you divide by p. So they're at so, okay, they're not going to be the same square, but they're going to be um, a squared is going to be e congruent to b squared modulo p, if you use that notation, different notation, a squared, b squared, same remainder, when divide by p. Okay, um, then a squared minus b squared must be a multiple of p. Ooh, exciting. Um, because they've got the same remainder, so when I subtract one from the other, I'll get zero remainder. Um, because I have a remainder from here, and then subtract the remainder from here, zero. Brilliant. Um, that's a multiple of p. Um, but hang on, difference of two squares 
that's a minus b times a plus b, uh, and p is prime, so hang on, neither of these factors is a multiple of p, um, because they're both too small. Um, because I've squared small numbers, smaller than p minus 1 over 2, um, a plus b is really small, um, and a minus b um, is, well, even smaller, right? Because of the difference of two numbers that are between naught and p minus 1 over 2. I guess it could be, hang on, no, yeah, it could be, it could be negative, so it could be <laughs> between minus p minus 1 over 2 and 0. Um, but these are both small in absolute value. Um, definitely neither of them is a multiple of p, so, hang on, p's a prime. Um, so on the one hand, p is supposed to be one of the prime factors of this number, but on the other hand, it, it's not one of the factors of, of either of these factors. Um, so, hang on a minute, um, something's, gone, something's gone wrong. Um, so this is not, uh, these are different. Oh, and Anonymous in chat has helpfully pointed out that I can actually include p minus one over two in this argument. Yeah, okay. These are, st are still different. Um, good, okay. Um, great stuff. Um, so it says you, you all you need to do, a little proof by contradiction, suppose that we got some repeats up to multiples of, of p, um, some of these gave the same remainder, the same quadratic residue. Well, actually that can't happen because that factorises and it can't be multiple of p, and also uh, not a multiple of p. Um, grand, okay. Um, so in this particular case, don't need to worry about it. Right, okay. Um, and somebody's posted a YouTube video that they claim is on quadratic reciprocity. There we go. Cool. Right. Okay. Good stuff. Um, that's what I want to say about that. I'm just going to quickly try and catch up with what's been going on in chat. There are 264 chat messages and I haven't read all of them. Uh, oh, Jazz Apple says, can you quickly prove Fermat's last dinner for us? Sure. No worries. I've got 23 minutes. Let's let's just go. Um, actually, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe this uh, live stream is not well enough, uh, large enough to hold it. Okay. Right. Grant. Grant. Okay. I'm saying grand a lot. Um, I'm planning the next minute of my life, I think. Um, okay, that was a test. That was, well, not a test, but that was a trial of me presenting math content on the internet. Who knows if that was good or not? Right, okay, let's turn that off. Um, complete and jarring change of gear. I'd like to talk about something completely different next. Um, uh, this is kind of an option for people who weren't interested in squares and number theory. Um, in between though, during this ad break uh, in the middle, um, I'd like to advertise uh, a program called Promise Europe. Um, if you're normally resident in Europe or the UK or kind of nearby, um, and you like number theory, so if that kind of uh, stuff about prime numbers or squaring numbers was uh, interesting to you, then you might be interested in Promise Ma Promise. Uh, Promise Europe. Um, Promise Europe. There's a link on the Oxford Maths homepage um, to uh, have a look at. Uh, that's going to have some interesting number theory problems posted as part of its application process, um, and as well as having a look at the application process problems, you could also apply for an intense four-week course on number theory. Um, cool. Right there you go. Um, suggestion of number theory stuff. Right. Okay. I've got a lot going on. Um, how do I come become better at maths as I am currently rubbish? says astral astral glaive db9 um practice maths do more maths questions do whatever maths you um do whatever maths is slightly too hard for you uh, is a, the normal advice i give um that works for everyone by the way um whether or not you're rubbish at maths even if you're good at maths try and do some maths problems that you can't quite do um right okay uh yeah my letters my someone's pretending to be me in chat which is very polite um, and criticising my handwriting. So ah, there you go. Standard, standard, isn't it? Um, and cool. Right, good. Do I give talks to schools? Usually, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Great. Cool. Right. Okay. We'll do one more thing, um, and then I'm going to wrap up the live live stream at half past five. Um, let's do one more thing. What do I want to do? I want to turn this on again. Someone asked what pro what platform were you using? I'm using um, Miro, which is an online whiteboard, and I've got a very cheap graphics tablet. And I've got a custom set of transitions that I'm testing out for the first time today. It's not the best live stream setup anyone's ever done. Right, let's try and turn this on. There we go. Um, right, okay. Um, I'd like to very quickly show you an interview question. Um, someone in chat says that they were interviewed by me. Um, I don't know who they are. Um, or someone in chat says they met me or something. Anyway, um, maybe someone in the chat has already seen this question. Um, but I'm going to talk about the interview question I used for 
um, maths at Oxford this year, um, kind of because I want to talk about the question and I want to talk about how people do it. This is nothing to do with number theory or squares or anything like that. Um, okay, let's have a go. Um, here's how the question works. Um, given two points in the xy plane, uh, and I'm going to tell you, oh, hello, still learning where the screen is. There we go. I'm going to tell you the uh, tell you their x coordinates are naught and one. I'm not telling you their y coordinates. I'm leaving those as y naught and y one. Okay, given two points in the xy plane. And given two numbers, m0 and m1, here's the question. Is there a cubic, so that's a cubic y equals cubic expression in x, um, is there a cubic, let's write out the cubic, that I want it to go through both points. And I want it to have a gradient or derivative. I want it to have derivative m0 at x equals 0. And I want it to have derivative m1 at x equals 1. OK. That was my interview question. Um, and because it's an interview, I sort of helped people through doing some algebra for it. Um, so most people um, started looking at this cubic and started thinking, well, what are these conditions? mean, um, what do these conditions mean? Um, and we'll try and apply those to the cubic. Um, anonymous in chat, are we allowed to talk about the questions we got? Um, sure, I think so. Um, I think you, you can talk about the the, the questions that you, you had in, in interview. Um, okay, um, in particular, so going back to the question, in particular, looking at um, looking at uh, the values, not y not y1, one, y1. One. People are trying to plug in numbers over there um, to work out conditions on A, B, C, and D. Uh, and if you do that, if you apply these conditions, uh, I'm not gonna do all of the algebra, but if you apply all of these conditions, uh, you get an equation over here from sending the cubic through this point. Um, I think it just says D equals y naught, so it's quite a nice, quite a nice equation. Um, if you send the cubic through this point, you get another equation um, through 1, y1. Um, yeah, okay, the y-intercept is y0. That's the thing that people said, and it means that d is, is y0 in terms of the coefficients. Um, okay, we're, we're going to try and solve for this cubic. And um, by the way, the answer is yes, there is a cubic, and you can solve for it. Um, okay, so if we send it through the point 1, y1, then we get another condition on the coefficients. So we get a plus b plus c plus d is equal to y1. Um, and we've got this condition about the derivative or the or the gradient. Um, and most people I knew, most people I interviewed were happy with the idea of a derivative or gradient. We did explain it a few times to talk about how that's that's the value of dy by dx at um, at the at the points. Um, so this is looking at the gradient or the, the derivative of the curve. If you haven't seen calculus yet, if you haven't seen derivatives of polynomials. Um, then this question is not for you. Um, uh, I was interviewing people who had seen derivatives of cubics before. It's one of the things I'm testing. Um, okay, don't worry if you haven't seen if you haven't seen derivatives. Then obviously this question is not going to make much sense. Cool. Right. Okay. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to work out the derivative first. Figure out the cubes. Yeah. Raphael says let's work out the work out the derivative first. Yeah. You can do either order. So yeah, we get one equation from sending it through naught y naught, one equation from sending it through one y one. Guess what? We're going to get another equation from sending it, th sending the derivative through x equals zero, uh, derivative equals m naught, and we're going to get a fourth equation from sending uh, the uh, derivative, making the derivative be m one, the number m one at x equals one. Let's do a little bit of that calculation. I don't want to do all of the calculation, um, but I want to give you a flavour of the calculation that I was making people do. Um, so cubic goes through the point naught y naught. That means that uh, y naught is equal to naught plus naught plus naught plus d. <laughs> ah, great equation. Um, sending it through the point one y one um, is y one is a plus b plus c plus d. Um, and then I need to go and work out dy by dx. So I need to differentiate this polynomial. Um, this is a skill that you learn 
somewhere near the start of sixth form mathematics in the UK. Um, other equivalent uh, qualifications are available. Um, okay, so you get something like this for the derivative. And what we want to do is we want to think about what the derivative is at x equals zero. Um, and at x equals zero, it's supposed to be m naught. So this derivative is supposed to be m naught at x equals zero. So that's naught plus naught plus c. Another fantastic equation. This one just says c is equal to m naught. Great. Uh, and then m1 is going to be equal to, uh, well, I plug in 1 to this expression to get 3a plus 2b plus c. Okay, um, great. So actually, we've got four equations, but two of them are kind of very nice. Two of them are pretty nasty. Um, Solving four simultaneous equations would be really hard. Solving two simultaneous equations, uh, I can do. So we can turn that frown upside down and go and solve what those things are. Um, that's, that's the kind of algebra approach to how to do this. Um, there's a separate, more interesting method that nobody used. Um, but I asked people about after. So I let them do some of this algebra. And then I showed them this kind of alternative method. Um, OK, here's how it works. So let's take your solution. Um, you've done all the algebra over there, let's say. Um, and kind of squint at it. So we've got this kind of A, B, C, D structure going on for this cubic. Um, and these terms are kind of these terms are kind of involved y naught, y1, m naught, m1 um, in all of these brackets. I mean these last two are pretty simple terms, but you know the the, the coefficients here depend on all of these numbers in the question. There are four numbers in the question, m0, m1, y0, and y1. Okay, um, here's what I asked candidates to imagine doing. I said, imagine horror upon horrors, multiplying everything out, and then regrouping terms together to bring together the y0 terms, then the y1 terms, and then anything that depends on m0, and then anything that depends on m1. Okay, so this is kind of quite abstract because I haven't filled in all of the details, um, but what you get when you multiply this out and regroup the terms together is you get a cubic inside the brackets. So each, each term here is a cubic. That actually gives us a different approach to the problem. So if I want to work out this cubic, if I want to work out this cubic, um, let's say both. Forget about the others for now. If I just want to work out this cubic, then I can consider the problem. Consider the problem, well, why, if I take y1 equals 0, m, m0 equals 0, my whiteboard has crashed. Oh, there we go. Y, m0 is 0, m1 is 0, and maybe I'll take y0 to be 1 as well. So it's a really special case. But if I take this special case, then whatever I got out of this horrible algebra for my big complicated solution has to simplify down to, well, something simple. It has to simpl simplify down to this cubic in here with the star. Um, because once I've taken y1 to be 0, m0 to be 0, m1 to be 0, and y1 to be 1, then I've eliminated everything over here, and I've just got this cubic left over. OK. I said this would give us a different way to think about the problem. Um, uh, a different way to think about the problem. And the way it works is to say, well, hang on. In this very simple case, Um, I've got y0 equals 1, y1 equals 0. Hang on, those were supposed to be the values um, of points that this was going through. This was supposed to go through naught, well now naught 1, and then 1, 0. So that's quite nice. I um, mean, it's supposed to have this bit here means that it's got, if you read back to the original problem, m0 is 0, m1 is 0, would mean we're looking in this very special case, we're looking for a, a cubic that's got 0 derivative. Um, zero derivative at zero and one. So this is quite a nice cubic. Um, it's sort of got no derivative here. It starts at one and comes down, and then it's got no derivative at one. Um, so this is this is quite nice. We could, if we tried a little bit, we could write down what this cubic is without doing all of that algebra. So we had all of this kind of horrible algebra that we didn't even finish doing because it was too horrible. Um, but instead of doing that algebra, we can think about this nice simple problem in here for just the y0 dependence. Um, so we can think about what's going on just in there. Okay. Um, so we, in a way, we could write down properties of this cubic without worrying too much about what it exactly is. 
Okay, uh, there's similar problems to think about for working out what this cubic is, of working out what the m0 terms do and what the m1 terms do. So there's these kind of separate problems going on. Right, okay, um, I've rushed through that um, uh, because I, part of the point of this was to skip some algebra and partly because um, I didn't want to calculate the other things either. Um, okay, um, but at, the, at the end, the idea here is that we've got these kind of separate problems um, and the big general solution, if you want all of these um, conditions to apply. You want a value at zero, you want a value at one, you want a derivative at zero, you want a derivative at one. Well, we think about those problems separately and then just add together the solutions we get. And that gives us a way to combine together a, a complicated problem from a simple problem. Ah, people have got suggestions about what this cubic might be um, by thinking about the fact that it's got a repeated root over here. Looks good. Okay, I think it's not quite that one because that one's zero at, uh, that one's zero at zero as well. But I like that one f as a candidate for possibly being uh, this one, because I think this one has. Okay, so this one is this one over here is describing no, not this one. Maybe this is this one. This one is describing the problem where there's a derivative at. It's got some derivative at zero, for the m naught thing, but it's got no derivative at m one. Um, it's got m one equals zero. It's got y naught equals zero. Uh, it's got y1 equals zero. Okay, great, cool. Um, how do I know each term is a cubic? Um, so it could be degree three, or it could be maximum degree three. That's a good good point. Um, so, so these things might not actually be cubics. They might be quadratics. Fine, okay. It turns out they are all cubics. Um, uh, but yeah, okay. I, I suppose I should have said at, at worst a cubic or something. Cool, right, okay. Uh, people, who, people who are doing GCSEs at the moment, sorry about this. This was, I mean about a year and a half ahead of where you are right now. Um, so there's a little look forward at the sort of calculations that we do with um, A-level mathematics. Um, we're looking here at kind of stationary points and where, whether the cubic's going up or down or it's uh, flat at the top. Okay, cool, right, okay, that was a cute question I did. Um, just to recap one more time, because somebody's asked for a recap. Um, my interview question this year that I asked to a few people, including some people who are here today, um, was to uh, find a cubic that satisfied certain conditions. Going through some points, which I think we all understand because that's just plugging in numbers into the cubic. Uh, and then also has a particular gradient at, at two points, um, at x equals 0 and x equals 1, the end points as well. Um, I'd like to know what that cubic is. Um, and because they're A-level mathematicians uh, in year 13, uh, they know a way to find the derivatives. So that gives them some more information about doing this problem. There is an algebraic method where you can work out the equations for the for the coefficients in terms of y0, y1, m0, and m1, the numbers in the problem. And you can go solve these and work out the cubic. You get a horrible mess of a cubic. Um, but if you regroup the terms, so if you multiply out all of that mess that you get from doing the algebra, you get some terms that depend on y0, some terms that depend on y1, some m0 terms, some m1 terms, and you can bunch those terms together to think about what's the y0 dependence. I guess that's the question we're asking here. Um, how does the solution depend on y0? Um, so we think here, thinking here, you know, you've done all this algebra. Or you've attempted to do all this algebra and you've got this complicated answer, how are we going to check the answer? Uh, and the best way to check your answer is to look at some special cases. Um, I've got some ideas about what special cases I'd like to look at, where I basically I want to cross stuff out by making it zero. Um, okay, so things I was looking for, uh, it's a good question from Anonymous, um, things I was looking for by asking this question, um, I wanted to see that people could do the kind of derivative stuff and plugging equations in. I don't care too much about actually solving the equations. Uh, and then I was looking to see whether people could understand the link back to the original question. Um, to say, if I if I split your solution up and if I try and check your solution, um, how does this relate back to what the original thing was? So to get to this kind of understanding about what this thing is, even though I haven't written it down, even though we didn't finish the algebra, so we haven't worked it out, haven't written it down, we get some understanding about what this cubic has to do um, and then maybe some appreciation that actually there's a sort of similar thing going on for the other cubics uh, or cubics at worst the other th things in brackets over here so that even though you know we haven't done all the algebra and we might have made a mistake in the algebra we know what to expect at the end we know what properties these things have so these are really nice cubics cool um, 
I like this so much that uh, this cubic is related to, just in the last five minutes here, um, this cubic is related to something called easing um, in animation. Um, so in, in animation, sometimes you want things to move and you don't want them to just move, you know, start moving and then get there and stop. You want them to move smoothly um, so that maybe something moves from one down to zero, starting with no velocity. Uh, if you make this as kind of a position, uh, this time, uh, then you can start with no velocity and just gently ease down and, and land somewhere else and, and slow down as it gets there. And you might be interested in cubics like this. Um, so finding this cubic can give you a way to animate things um, to give them no, um, no velocity and then gently move, slow down as they get there and then stop just as they get there nice and smoothly. Um, so this is an animation technique called easing. Um, you don't have to use cubics. Um, you, can, you can do it with this cubic if you like. There are other functions out there that give you kind of different behaviors um, if you want to animate in slightly different ways, whether it's going quickly or slowly, um, whether it's doing something uh, more complicated like bouncing or going past and then coming back a bit. Um, there are different easing techniques. Um, this is the one that I'm using on, <laughs> this is getting a little messy here, but um, on the big port over here that opens and closes, um, I'm using easing there, not on the position, but on the size. Um, so that when it closes, it starts large um, and it, it starts and it just gradually gets smaller and then it speeds up and then it slows down as it gets smaller. Um, so just give it a little bit of smoothness uh, using this cubic from the interview question. Okay, um, wrapping up at the end here, um, I'd like to finish by giving you a little bit of homework and then we'll hang around and talk a bit in chat. Um, homework problem, I'd like to go way over here. Where did I start? I was way over here. Um, I'd like to think a little bit about six-digit squares. Um, so we're going to return to bigger squares. Six-digit squares. Um, here's the problem. Let's say I give you the second digit, the fourth digit, and the sixth digit. So let's say I reveal to you the second digit, the fourth digit, and the sixth digit. Um, here's the question. Does this always uniquely determine the square? So I guess what I'm asking here is, is this a puzzle where you, um, if I do this sort of puzzle, is it like the very first ones we did, where there was a unique answer, or is there sometimes not a unique? Uh, is there sometimes not a unique answer? I don't know the answer for this, by the way. Um, uh, I don't know whether there's a unique solution to this or not. I'm not going to tell you either. Um, so if I give you the second digit, the fourth digit, and the sixth digit, in this example they're one, eight, and nine, but they could be anything, right? Well, maybe not anything, um, but they could be something else. Um, given the second digit, the fourth digit, and the sixth digit, does this uniquely determine the square? Um, that's something for you to think about. If you find this too easy, let's think about eight-digit eight digit squares instead, or ten-digit squares, where I give you every other, every other digit, including the last one. Um, can you find me an example where these things share the second, fourth, and sixth digits, um, or are they always different? Okay, cool. Right, that, there you go. Homework instead of your actual maths homework, or maybe more more homework on top of any maths homework that you've got. Um, we're going to hang out in chat. Um, I'm going to finish just by... Um, Asking uh, for a, a sort of swap, so I advertise Q&A, I guess we'll, we've been doing some good Q&A throughout, I've seen people asking questions, I'm going to hang out and answer some admissions questions. Um, I want to show you uh, one last thing, let's do a switch, it's going to close, it's going to ease and close and open again. Um, so if you're interested in the stuff that we've seen today, um, there's some further reading, um, that's going to be in a free weekly email newsletter. Um, the way this works is you can sign up for the newsletter on the website. Um, it asks you to swap some information about yourself uh, in order to get that extra bit of mathematics. Um, we're not going to do anything like advertising or anything evil with your data. Um, we're just interested in who's watching and what this means to you. Um, so I hope this is a kind of acceptable swap. You tell me a little bit about you. I don't, I don't want your name or your address or anything crazy. Um, you tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, to sign up for uh, an online newsletter where we'll send you more stuff related to stuff we've been talking about today. Um, okay, so that's sign up at the club homepage, which is maths.off.uk slash r slash club. Um, 
I think I'll stop there. That's all from us today. Um, we're going to be hanging out and chat a little bit just to finish answering some questions that I've seen just come in. Um, otherwise, I'll see you in 167 hours for the next Oxford Online Maths Club live stream. Take care, everyone. Bye. Now I work out how to turn it off. We're going to watch the easing. It's going to go slow, fast, slow. Okay. Oh, too many ages to work out how to do that. Right, okay. Bye, everyone. See you next week. <laughs> so professional.